Hello, hello, hello. Hey, yes, it does work. So, um, yeah, I think what I'll do is switch gears just for a minute and move over to my Seaboard and tell you guys a little bit about it. Oh, yeah, cool. I will do that. Yeah, thanks. I like that plan. Cool. So, um, I've been very involved with uh, with this company called Roly and this new instrument that I'm really excited about and I've had a lot to do with kind of bringing it up to the point that it's at now. Um, so I have two seaboards up here. Uh, this is our grand model on the bottom. And uh, and the newer one is the rise at the top, very small, <coughs> excuse me, very small uh, keyboard, very powerful. Uh, and basically, these instruments allow you to have real expressive control of your touch. So the beauty of them is that Unlike a um, traditional kind of keyboard, which when you play a note, it's more like you know, you're turning it on, you're lifting up your hand, you're turning it off. Sometimes there's some pressure, which is usually not very organic feeling because you're pressing into a bottom of a key. And that's the standard way that we've all been used to. But on a C board, uh, everything really changes, which is really, really cool um, because you can press a note like this note. And I can then like wiggle the note around and get vibrato. I can press into it and get some kind of a timbral change if I want to. So if I play a chord or like, a, let's say I'll just do two notes now, I can hold the note with my thumb steady while I move the upper one around. It's more like a guitar or like a violin or something like that. And what's really cool, I always had this dream that I could like kind of articulate on the keyboard like yeah, this kind of thing. And at any point be able to slide around. So one day this guy walks into my house named Roland Lamb, who is the uh, you know, inventor and the CEO of Roly Labs. And he opens up this case and he shows me this. And I go, oh my God. That's exactly, you know, this is totally like what I've been dreaming about for the longest time. Something that is keyboard based, that has the piano form factor. So you can play it like a piano, all the distances are the same. Um, but you have this additional control. So what's really cool is every note that you play is completely independent. So I can bend one note and not the other. I can use the ribbon that's at the top of the keyboard to slide. I can use the ribbon that's at the bottom of the keyboard to slide as well. So I have a choice of where I want to go. But the cool thing is that all the keys, basically we call them key waves. So the piano-like uh, key wave sits within a certain uh, area on the playing surface, but on top of the key wave and at the bottom, it goes to the ribbon. But the reality is that the note actually, um, the notes actually uh, occur even below and above. So if I wanted to hit, let's say, this C, I could play it on the ribbon, I could play it above the key here, or I could play it on the key itself. But if I want to do a pitch bend, I can do what we call a legato bend, and this is really cool. So I want to do like uh, a bend from this G to this A, I can use like a gesture and go. So just by pushing into it and sliding, I'm actually getting a pitch bend and I can hold this microphone and talk to you. I could not do that on my wonderful Korg. That's a really unique feature. So everything is directly in, in control with my hands. So I'll play a little bit and you can see how I can bend in different directions and the kind of like uh, musicality and control you can have on an instrument like this. Thank you. 
So it's a, it's a whole lot of fun to play, but of course you don't only have to play mellow sounds. There's um, also a lot of other sounds that we like to play. And uh, I just got back from London where we were working on, um, we were working on uh, the sounds for the rise. I'm going to uh, ask my uh, protege and good friend uh, Aaron Boshbu to join me for the next part of this um, so we can do some combination things uh, and show you a little bit more about it. Aaron, are you around? He's, he's coming, yeah. Um, while he does that, I can show you on the rise, one of the fun things to do is to play like you know, my, my lead sounds. So, can you give that a little more gain for me? I don't hear it too well. Mm. A, a perfect example of being able to kind of play the lead, hold the microphone, and do all the pitch bending. And what I love about it is that unlike just a standard pitch wheel, I can, or joystick, I can bend wherever I want to. So I want to bend an octave up, I want to go like... You know, sometimes I'll set, like on a, on a standard keyboard, I'll set my joystick for a whole step up, an octave down. Um, but, you know, on this I don't have to worry about it at all. I can go as low as I want, as high as I want, and do these bends. It's kind of like what I like call like the Steve Vai mode or something like that, where he's so amazing with his whammy bar. He's like holding on a note. Next thing, it's like. The other cool thing about this um, particular instrument, the rise, is that it not only goes with pressure, like left and right for pitch and the ribbon, but it also looks at your position on the key. So like with the sound, I can be like... So it gets very, very fun, flexible, very musical. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, the gentleman I have on the stage with me is Aaron Boshbu, who I discovered actually on YouTube. Yes, we are the YouTube generation. He was conducting a full orchestra in Turkey, and he was conducting my music. What a nerve. He, <laughs> he had arranged the whole, like, what do you do, Octavari all of Octavarium or in six degrees. Like, he took these pieces and made these arrangements for orchestra that pretty much blew my mind. And I called him, to make a long story very short, I called him up, I said, hey, um, that's pretty amazing what you're doing over there. I said, would you like to uh, help to arrange a concerto that I was commissioned to write? And he was like, yeah, let's do that. So we, uh, we embarked on a whole lifelong kind of friendship here. And uh, my wife and I brought Aaron to uh, Berkeley where he got through the whole program with a full scholarship and honors and all the stuff. And uh, recently he is the conductor Doctor on Dream Theater's Breaking the Fourth Wall uh, DVD. And uh, what are you, still 16? What, what age are you now? <laughs> he's a little older than that now. But uh, he's also a very talented keyboardist. And seaboardists, I got him working for us at Roly. Very pleased with that. Um, it's a very unique company with now some of the greatest keyboardists, in my opinion, on the planet. And Aaron is one of them. And he's going to uh, continue where I left off with seaboard stuff. And I'm going to switch over to show you some of my own iPad uh, stuff. I'm working on a new app called GeoShred. It's pretty cool. So I'm going to let him get set up and I'm going to bring my iPad over there and show you some more things. Sounds, that's one of them. 
think it's time that we had a guest on stage to ask me some questions to interview me, and I feel like asking Mitch Gallagher to come and join me. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you, Mitch? I am right here. I'm not going to say no if you ask. Just rock and roll. Here we are. <laughs> Jordan Rudis, everybody. <laughs> Got to give it up for him. That's amazing. You're really going to make me climb in there? Yep. All right. Um, here I go. Can do that? I can do it. He can do it. Check that, out. Check that out. You guys having a good time? Yes. All right. Would you please give it up for CME, for Korg, and especially for Roly, who are so responsible for uh, bringing Jordan in here with us and uh, helping put on this show. Hello, hello. There we are. We're so we on. were talking earlier. I didn't get a chance to ask you, but if I remember correctly, did you not come to Sweetwater way back when, like in the early 90s? Yeah, you guys had like a small barn or Just something little, in another neighborhood. A shack I and a gravel the, Yeah, <laughs> I remember it. I literally remember one small room that yeah. I walked into and I was showing, what, uh, like... Uh, Kurzweil, probably. Was it a Kurzweil or maybe, a Korg yeah, or yeah, something remember. like that? Korg, yeah. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I walked in this place. I was completely blown away. I mean, this is an amazing facility. It's just like... It's a long way from there, isn't it? It took me a long time to get here, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here. So, yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. Cool. So you were uh, definitely a piano prodigy. How did you get started playing piano at a very early age? Uh, I got started because I would go into my second grade classroom and play on the little piano they had in the corner, and the kids would do, like, you know, second grade type songs, and uh, I would accompany them. And one day the teacher called up my mother and said, uh, oh, your child is playing the piano so beautifully in the classroom. And my mother said, what are you talking about? We don't even have a piano. And the teacher said, well, you better get one because he's playing very well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so sh we, she quickly got a little white, like, SD baby grand piano in the house and called up one of these teachers that comes around to the, uh, you know, students for half an hour. And uh, the guy, st it got very um, suspicious because the guy came and he quickly took away the little red book that everybody studies and he was teaching me the chords and then he started to teach me for free. So my mother and her friends who were a little bit more hip to, like, music education and stuff said, maybe you should take him to, like, another, like, teacher, like a more serious teacher because he seems to be doing pretty well based on the fact that the teacher's not charging. Anyway, that was kind of how things got started. Right, and from there to uh, Juilliard, correct? From there, well, it wasn't a direct shot. I actually had this uh, wild uh, Hungarian woman named Magda who used to give me little kicks under the table. It was funny because when I went to Magda, you know, she was really, really serious, and, and I thought I was learning, you know, like the real deal, and kind of I, I was. Uh, but when I went to, but she got me ready for Juilliard, so I spent about a year and a half or so with Magda, and then I went to audition for Juilliard, um, and I was like nine and a half years old or something, and uh, I got to my first lesson with this woman, Catherine Parker, and she said, okay, well, the way you're playing is totally wrong. You know, she started me back on some easy Bach piece and uh, relearned from there. So you had to completely rebuild your technique? And yeah, pretty much, yeah. Wow. I mean, she, she, my Juilliard teacher was from a very distinguished line of uh, piano teachers. She, she was the assistant to Rosina Levine, who is one of the most Famous, the most famous piano teacher of the last 150 years. So that's the line, luckily, that I kind of like studied. Right, yeah. incredible, incredible. How long were you at Juilliard? Uh, I was there until I was 19. It was the day that I, I actually went through the whole pre-college division. I was kind of ready to leave because somebody turned me on to like an ELP record, Tarkus, and some Patrick Moraz mini mogul riffs, and I was kind of had my head in a different place, but it was a lot of kind of like pressure to keep on going. So I, I got into the college level, and then I remember the day I was studying with a woman named Adele Marcus, who was also a great teacher. I had been studying the G minor Chopin uh, Ballade, and um, I got, I was, I was playing it. I thought I was playing it pretty well for studying it for a week, and she came over and she took the music away. And I stopped. She said, why'd you stop? I said, well, I need the music. She said, well, when you're studying with me, you know, after a week, you should have it memorized. It was like a 40-page piece, you know? So I said, oh, really? Okay. And I left, and I had never seen her again, because I, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> that was totally it. Right, I didn't right. want to do that. Right. So what happened after that? You left, you left school, you were starting to get into synthesizers and, uh, and uh, rock music? Yeah, I left school. I entered a very interesting period of time. Um, you know, it was, it was difficult for me to like, connect with like, making a living or figuring out how to take my interests and, and like, become part of the real world, because there were no like, Berkeleys and there were no you know, musicians, institutes, and places that 
taught like how to like use a synthesizer in a cool way, my only option was maybe to go to like you know the Juilliard thing and learn how to like make bleeps and blops with you know modular synthesizers. It, it was totally not my headspace. So um, I you know got a mini Moog. I made spacey sounds. I joined a completely like psychedelic space band and floated around a bit, played some midnight shows on college radio stations and, you know, got a pitch wheel, a pitch uh, pedal on my mini Moog that took me from below your hearing to above it. And I floated like that for a while and did some various things until I kind of eventually figured out like how to take my interests and, uh, and make it work in the, in the world as we know it. And you put out a, a independent cassette and then a solo uh, solo record, and you were named Best New Talent by Keyboard Magazine in 1994? Yeah, well, actually, the, the, the path, although it took a long time to kind of, like, figure it all out, uh, basically what happened was when I was in Juilliard, I was pretty much told or convinced that anybody who didn't play, like, classical music, was into rock, was kind of like a lower-level human being and a lower-level musician, and I was hypnotized, kind of, like, to really believe that, and I didn't, and I knew that I was interested in electronics, and I was interested in rock, and I didn't know how to interface with any of those people, so it took a little time to, like, figure that out, that, that what, what they had you believe was not really true. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a, a confusing Yeah, I bet. Thing. I bet. So how did you uh, connect with the dregs? Oh, okay. So the way that all kind of worked is finally I, I um, was at a point where I wanted to, I, I realized what I kind of needed to do, and I wanted to get in front of people, meet people that were in the industry, and I remember that I had a friend whose name is Jack Hotop. And uh, he is a wonderful guy, and he's a, a, you know amazing sound programmer for Korg for many years. So I called him up. I said, "Hey, Jack. I said, you know, I'm interested in maybe doing something with Korg, and you know, is there a possibility?" He said, "Oh, yeah. Well, actually, we're looking for a product specialist." So. I went and I auditioned to do the product specialist gig and I got the gig and I started this other kind of life and I was doing like sounds and making demos for the products and going to the NAMM shows and people were starting to write about me because I would go to the NAMM shows, I would always write like a really cool like progressive piece of music and, um, and that was kind of how things got going and I went from Korg and then I uh, took a little time off and I made an album called Listen which, which was my first real kind of like solo album and then I joined Kurzweil for a while and, and Kurzweil for a while and that and that I started as a product, product specialist but I quickly kind of made it my own job and was hiring like my friends to do demos and sounds and you know, occasionally I'd go out and do something as well and one day and my career was starting to take off and uh, and one day the guy who was uh, running Kurzweil at the time called me and said, Jordan, he says, we really like you, but we can't like have you working for Kurzweil and like being like a professional musician. And you know, it says now it's not working for us. So I said, okay, so I'll go. So it's about that time that I got offered a job actually with Dream Theater and also the Dregs at the same time. And at the time I didn't take the Dream Theater gig, I took the job with the Dregs because I knew who they were. I knew who Steve Morse was, Rod Morgenstein, all these guys. And I thought that sounded really cool. Not that the Dream Theater thing didn't, but it was just an opportunity that made sense for me at the time. Yeah, sure. And that led to the Rudis Morgenstein project. And how did that transition to, well, it didn't transition, but how did you move from there to liquid tension experiment? Yeah, so, um, well, I had met the Dream Theater guys, and so they were well aware who I was. Matter of fact, in my first audition for them, I showed them this piece that I wrote called Over the Edge, and they, start, they tried to play it, and they you know did fine. It was all good. So we made friends, we connected, and then... I went my way and did my own thing. Meanwhile, Mike Portnoy, um, he was forming a band and he thought of me. He wanted to find great players, you know, in each category. And he, um, and he called me up and he said, you know, I would really like you to do this thing. This is called Liquid Tension Experiment. So I ended up, and, and John Petrucci wasn't supposed to be the guitarist on it at first, but it just kind of happened that he, you know, he was available, it worked out, it made sense. So he came on, so I was working now with Mike Portnoy and John Petrucci and Tony Levin. And uh, a really interesting thing because they were coming from the Dream Theater world I was coming from my world and Tony was coming from his and I could really relate to Tony's headspace. Tony is a classically trained musician. He reads music and obviously so do I. And so I was able to kind of be the interface almost between like dream theater and, you know, like and Tony. And so I, I came this like interesting middleman, um, which was kind of cool. And those albums did very well for instrumental albums. I think people still comment to me today that Liquid Tension is some of their favorite stuff, which is so nice. Um, and so at the end of the second Liquid Tension 
uh, album's recording process, John and Mike came up to me and said, hey, Jordan, you know, hypothetically speaking, whatever, like, if we asked you to join Dream Theater at this point, what would you say? So this has been some years later, and I said, you know what, now is a really good time. And, uh, and then I joined the group. And I thought it was actually going to be kind of the same because, you know, I was just working with John and Mike. But when I went into the studio, well, instead of a really tall, bald guy playing bass and stick and all that, you had this Asian guy with really long black hair that didn't speak very much. And he was playing bass. And, but the dynamic really shifted. And it was a big change. And it was about 16 years ago. And it was a major life change. I mean, it led, it's led me all around the world so many times and introduced me to so many people. And uh, as a composer and a keyboard, it's been an incredible experience leading even you know, up to now. And I feel like uh, we're actually mixing the new album as we speak. And uh, it's really been a great ride. It's That's always awesome. changing and going to be really cool. Yeah, what an incredible story. Incredible progression through there. So do you attribute your success in that area to being tremendously prepared, to making contacts, to networking, to having the musical background? What... what what is it that led them to ask you to join the group? Well, um, one thing that really worked for Dream Theater, which was not a musical thing, which is you know important nonetheless with a group, we all, you know, many of us know the dynamics that can happen with a group, is they were going through a lot of changes, a lot of emotional changes. People were wanting, maybe wanting to leave, or the, you know, there's some confusion. And they needed, I think they needed somebody who could come in and kind of maybe balance the whole thing out. You know, I was a middle son, kind of mellow, uh, good at flowing with things, maybe sometimes too good at it, but I let you know, things kind of go. And, and I think that energy between all of them really worked and, and has helped even to this day to, you know, add some smoothness to the operation because bands can be extremely complicated. So you need to be, and there's like no other business there is. You need to be able to let certain things go and ride with them. Otherwise, there is no band. Like sometimes like a friend or, you know, uh, my wife will see something or just somebody I'm talking to go, how do you even like deal with that? That's not cool. And I go, you know what? It's all good. Like this guy, this is how we have a band. You know, you gotta let you gotta let some things go. But I will say the guys in my band are all very cool, and it's an unusual group, very um, dedicated, and and you know, all hardworking, all like you know, instead of like snorting coke and having hookers in the back, we're generally like practicing scales and arpeggios and seventeen eight. You know, it's like kind of like that type of a groove. Right, right, awesome, awesome. So shifting gears a little bit, when you came out, you your first piece was improvised on the piano. Yes. You're a composer. How do you approach an improvisation like that? Do you come out with a germ of an idea in your head? Do you have a chord progression in your head, a melody? Where does it come from? Well, I generally don't have any... Well, in that case, I had no idea in my head. I thought I was going to play a Crim King Crimson song, but somehow I didn't. So... Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. It's just... You know, what it, what it is, is for me, making music is... Um, the challenge or the beauty of it is trying to remain open enough and calm enough and flowing that I, I mean, I kind of believe that all the music is kind of like out there, if you want to think of it as, en without getting too metaphysical, like all the energy, the music, it's all there for the taking. And if I can, you know, really be a receptor, kind of if my antennas can be up, my emotions can be open to be a transmitter almost to like all you guys or just into the air or whatever, then it'll, then it'll happen. I mean, I have, uh, you know, one thing that enables me to do it, it's, it's not all spacey. You know, part of it is having, you know, I use the keyboard as my way to do this. And if my fingers didn't move and my fingers weren't trained to do kind of what's in my head, there would be no music being played on the keyboard, no matter what I thought. I'd have to do it in a different way. And the technology is kind of moving in that direction. But in the meantime, I'm playing keyboards and I have, the, you know, some means to do that. So I always say these instruments are, you know, even if it's a seaboard or a keyboard or whatever, they're physical instruments and there's no, you know, magic there. You got to have fingers that can, you know, play the notes. So um, there's that part. And the other part is even if your fingers can do it, you still, if you hear something in your head, how are you going to know what it is? Like, what is that? You know, you hear, mm hmm, like, what notes are those? So, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, to have perfect pitch and to have trained my ear so I can kind of, even under pressure, kind of, you know, go for it. And that's and the funny thing about that is I think that everybody experiences that no matter who you are, um, that can vary according to your nervous system, you know, just your energy level in general. Sometimes your ear might be spot on. Some of you might say, oh, like today I can really recognize like an E. But the next day you go, you know, damn, I, I, I don't get it. Like today my ear's not on. And me too. Like sometimes I'll walk on stage, I'll be really nervous or whatever. And, and 
it won't flow as much. I won't be calm enough to really make that like connection and put it out like that. Um, so that's kind of like what the game is about. So it's about like developing your your person first of all, so you even stand a chance, and then developing your ear and your if it, in case of a guitar, a keyboard, a physical instrument, violin, voice. You have to develop the chops to be able to kind of make it happen. Right, right. The uh, second piece you played, uh, if I remember correctly, was the a guitar piece that you were doing on the, the Kronos, the third, second or third piece, right? When you're playing a sound like that, do you feel constrained to doing things that only that instrument would play, or do you feel that it should just go where it goes? Um, you know, to a certain point, the sound dictates how I play. Like, that guitar one I did, I mean, obviously I was playing some riffs that you'd have to be a pretty interesting guitar player to, uh, to make that happen. But some things were very guitar-like, so I like to play with that line. I like, to, I like to go into it with an awareness of what that instrument really is. And then if I take a liberty, if I do something that's not the guitar, well, it's not a guitar, it's a keyboard. And, uh, and I'm not trying to emulate, if I was really trying to emulate the guitar, it wouldn't so much work. But I think if it does work, then it's because I'm just, the sound is the sound, and I'm going for something else. And a lot of times what I'll do with my own sounds when I make them is I'll make a sound that is reminiscent of something, but I'll add a texture to it that takes it out of that realm enough that it's a special instrument, that it's something, you know, unique, a little bit different. Right, right. As a trained classical pianist and working with alternate controllers, and you've worked with a lot of them over the years, do you find that you have to totally shift your mental approach to sit down at a new instrument and learn to play it, or do you just translate your piano technique and add to it, or how do you approach that, learning that new instrument? Yeah. Well, um, some years ago, I was sitting around playing with um, my iPhone. The iPhone had just come out, and I can literally remember sitting playing with an extremely basic like piano app, it had like one octave, hardly did anything. And I was sitting there, my, my wife was actually like, why are you playing with that stupid thing? We have a, you know, a Steinway D in the other room that we just got, and like, it didn't make any sense to her. I was like, no, honey, it's okay, I, I got an idea here. You know, she, think, she thinks I'm crazy, she thought I was crazy that day. Um, but I said, no, I got, I got something on my mind. And so I was looking for, I, I had this kind of thought that there was some higher expression that was possible on this multi-touch surface, even though the app did nothing. So I kept my eye, and I'm not a programmer, but I have a good feeling for instruments and what they should, could do. So I kept my eye on the, on the Apple iTunes app store, and I was looking for something that might have given me a feeling like one of the guys who made it was doing, you know, was a capable programmer to make my vision come true. So I found something that was interesting, and I called the guy, I said, hey, you know, would you like to work on an app together? I have some ideas. And he was like, yeah, that sounds really cool. So I've always looked for other ways to like create music. I'm not only interested in just pressing keys, but what really inter the dream really was to be able to play specific notes and to be able to slide between the notes. So anytime doing more definite things and then freely sliding. So I started that whole kind of idea with my apps and then I started an app business and we made a bunch of apps that were kind of like that, like MorphWiz is like that, or SampleWiz or Geosynthesizer is very much like that, all like iPhone, uh, iOS apps. Um, and then, somewhere along that line, I had heard, well, I've been trying some other instruments. The Continuum was a great instrument by Lippold Hocken, which is a flat kind of 3D surface um, that you can slide around and do like a vertical play on a note and do all this kind of stuff. And I worked a little bit with Lippold on some of the pitch intelligence that's on that instrument. It was really an interesting uh, conversation which led to some nice musical results. And then, you know, slowly but surely, I kind of uh, the seaboard was brought to my attention. The uh, the guy who invented it, uh, invented it, Roland Lamb, was a really interesting, great guy. He came to my house, and uh, he opened it up. He showed it to me. I said, "What took you so long to get here?" Because it was so like dialed into what my thinking was. It was doing all the cool, like expressive things that I wanted it to do, but it was based on a keyboard. So I was like, "This is great. We have to work together." So we been working together and I've kind of been, uh, you know, working with the team, playing it, showing people, giving them ideas, working on the pitch intelligence since that's one of the things that, you know, I, I uh, kind of brought into this world. Um, and it's been a great ride because now I was just there last week and we were working on this little instrument called the Rise, which is so totally cool. Um, and that's kind of been my, my journey with, a, with these new expressive instruments. And because of that experience, when I go up to one that does something cool, like playing, and like, you know, playing a note and sliding vertically, to me, I'm like, okay, well, what took so long to make that happen? 
because that's what I was doing the first day. I was, you know, imagining something on the on the uh, iOS technology. So you are uh, tremendously busy. Your credits are extensive with Dream Theater and with uh, with so many guest projects. You have side projects. You're touring. You have your uh, iOS company making apps. You're writing classical music and, and doing those sorts of things. How do you balance all of those along with keeping up with technology and with your playing and I have technique a family. and everything else? And a family. Okay, I deserve a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> How do I do that? I don't even I don't know. know. I'm ready to retire after hearing that. <laughs> That's a long list. Um, I think because I'm pretty crazy. I, I mean, the, re the reality is that, you know, musicians are unlike anybody else. I mean, a lot of us know that. I mean, when people go, when, when the rest of the crowd goes home, the working crowd goes home, it's the musician who stays and is still working. You know, I was here all afternoon with Aaron, and we were programming the synthesizers, and we could probably could have skipped the meal and, you know, just jumped right into this. That's just kind of like what we do, if, you know, if we're really dedicated to it. I mean, I've worked so many, you know, all-nighters, and just to get the job done, to program a synthesizer, to, to write a piece for a deadline, the, the hours, they, they really don't stop. So for me, it's just the passion, it's the dedication, it's the sound. I mean, I have, you know, it can be very painful, like developing an instrument can be really challenging. There's software bugs, there's hardware bugs, there's stuff you want it to sound, you imagine it's gonna sound like something, and it's close, and then you get another build, and it's closer, but it might crash, and it's pretty frustrating, but at the same time, there's that, you know, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, because you know it's gonna be, you know, so cool. So that's what kind of keeps it going, because I'm really into the sound, passionate about, you know, music. Right, you've also written two books, is that right? Correct. Yeah, you're definitely busy. Definitely busy. Right. Matter of fact, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one more question before you go. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> I, when we have a extremely high level musician like yourself mm -hmm. here, I always ask this same question. Yeah. You've worked with everyone from David Bowie to Stephen Wilson. You mentioned Tony Levin, Rod Morgenstein, Steve Morris, the guys in Dream Theater. Extremely right. high level musicians as well. Is there a defining characteristic for those extremely high level virtuosic musicians? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, it's the passion and the dedication. A lot of those guys are guys who sit and practice and they really shed. I mean, there's some in that list that don't. but um, And that's okay because they're different kinds of musicians. Um, but I'm just attracted to the people who do spend the time and even the ones who don't necessarily like shed, like trying to be a virtuoso at their instrument, they're still completely absorbed and involved in their art form and they're working it. Um, like a guy like Stephen Wilson, who's so immensely talented and I have total respect. He's not necessarily sitting there practicing scales, but he's in his studio who he's always mixing, he's always thinking, he's doing surround mixes, he's you know producing, he's working his craft, his craft, he'll, he'll tell you, he's a composer or producer, he plays the guitar. But, you know, it's the dedication, it's the constant time. You know, John Petrucci, of course, is probably practicing, you know, right now. John Myung is definitely practicing right now. I mean, Mike Mangini is playing 17, eight in one hand, four in his foot, and, you know, six in the other hand while whistling Dixie. I don't know what he's doing. But, um, but these are the kind of guys, you know, that uh, are important to, you know, for, for me to be with, that inspire me. Awesome. I'm sure you guys have some questions. Anybody have a question for Jordan? I'm going to step off. I'm going to let you uh, talk with the audience here, and then I think you're going to play some more music, aren't yes. you? Awesome. All right. Okay. Thank cool. you very much. Very cool. Hi, Jordan. Big hey. fan. Um, who would be your favorite movie composer, and what piece would they influence that you've written? My favorite music, movie composer. Um, it, it depends on the mood. I, I really like Thomas Newman, and of course Hans Zimmer is amazing. You always get inspired by his work. Howard um, Shore. I'm not. I'm not that. Yeah. Also great. I mean, uh, first, I don't see a whole lot of movies. I don't have a whole lot of time. But when I do hear something really great, it can be very inspiring. And I like being an improviser. I kind of think like that. Although I've never, I haven't done a lot of scoring uh, to picture. Um, if I ever take a break from all the things that Mitch was talking about, maybe I will. Uh, but movie music and those guys are really inspiring. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Got one right here. How exactly do you and John approach unison sections like in In the Name of God, Never Enough, yeah. A Nightmare to Remember? 
How exactly do you and John write those unison sections? Um, how do we play them? Okay. Well, usually it'll be a combination. The actual composition of those sections will, will most often be a combination of our, you know, uh, working together towards the goal of having the section written. And if he's writing it, I'll literally, like, note. I'll, I end up notating whatever it is anyway. And very often it's some, like, ridiculous, crazy thing that needs some finger. you know, really get it done properly, needs some fingering, so I'll put the fingering in and I'll learn it. And it'll, you know, sometimes it comes really quick, other times I've got to practice it more. Um, but we're really, really picky when it comes to those, like, fast unison sections. We need to uh, make sure that they're super tight. Like, we're very anal about that. So, um, we, you know, first comes the composing and very often what we'll do is John will say okay now you know write a harmony to it of course that's my job so I'll uh, <clears throat> I'll get my music paid and I do it all you know like this on pencil and paper really uh, I'll just I'll, I'll write down his part whatever we established and then I'll look at it and I'll say oh you know this is an interesting harmony and a lot of times it's in thirds but other times like yeah I don't want I don't want to write it in thirds I want to do something more interesting so I'll put some other intervals and maybe make it a little wacky or crazy or who knows uh, but the important part is to really articulate it and have it be as tight as, you know so it has that kind of effect almost like a razor going through your brain or something like that you know so it's really really clean and precise but those parts are always fun yeah if you could describe the feeling you get when playing the piano, what would you describe it as? Uh, would you put the sound, sound of the mic in the monitor so I could hear better? Because oh, yeah. I didn't hear you too well. Yeah. Tell me when. Try now. Okay. Ah. <laughs> if, you, if you could describe the feeling you get when playing, what would you describe it as? Oh, that's a very nice question. So, um, well, like, uh, I can describe the feeling of when I came out and started to play. So for me, like playing the piano or playing the music is a way to like make this interesting like connection and to, to like feel good. I mean, if you, if you can feel connected, like you're in tune with something, somebody, something, yourself, then you generally feel pretty good. So if I can actually be making music and I consider making music when you are in tune with yourself, then the feeling, then there's a real high. So when I was playing, you know, I was, I'm like, in a way, searching for that feeling. I want to open myself up to that feeling and allow it to come through and become kind of this larger than life, you know, musical creature. And if I can achieve that, then it's great. But of course, you know, when I come out this, you know, I'm a human being, there's nerves involved, I'm thinking, you know, kind of analyzing what am I playing, what's, you know, what are the chords, do people like it, but not too much of that. I was, like, tonight I felt pretty good about just kind of going with it and flowing and, 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 a, and a good feeling, because of course that's my goal to, you know, bring to the audience. If, I'm, if I choose to play in front of people, that's my job, right? To not only feel, you know, happy to feel good about the music I make, but to also be able to transmit it out to, uh, you know, somebody else. So, yeah. Does that answer the question? Oh, cool. Okay. Get this one right here. Thanks. Really enjoyed the music so far. Oh, uh, nice. And with your iPad, Thank certainly you. you're the technical guy to ask. I, I got to ask about the the, the Seaboard. Is it um, is it just strictly a controller? It's just sending out data and, oh, cool. and everything else going on. I'm sitting there watching you play it, and the first thing that comes to my mind is, wouldn't that make it a heck of a lot easier to, um, if I'm writing into uh, wor uh, into uh, workstation software in the computer and I need a cello part and I need it to sound right. In the same way that I hate playing timpani parts, yeah. if I'm going to to play them, I need a pad and sticks because right, right. it just doesn't go. Yeah. Is it strictly a control? It's just sending out like MIDI continuous data in the normal way to your machine? Yeah. Um, you. Actually, the grand one, the larger Seaboard, uh, has embedded sounds. So it will it can be a controller. It'll send out MIDI sends a lot of MIDI, but it also has internal sounds. You don't need to connect it to anything. It'll have sounds. The, um, the Rise, the new one, that's strictly a controller, and it sends out MIDI for every note that you play. So, no, it actually behaves pretty well. Roly is, is, is very kind of on top. The company makes it very on top of that. Matter of fact, they're working with different manufacturers and kind of really changing the whole way that, that it all comes together, which is very exciting because all these companies that are, have been making all these experimental controllers don't usually do that. And Roly has meetings and they talk about the way that MIDI works between 
you know, the different instruments and DAWs. And I think that this is like the first time I've like seen a, uh, an instrument that actually stands a very good chance of making a huge difference in the way that we make music. Matter of fact, I see this instrument as something that will enable arrangers and composers and, and uh, people who use a small keyboard with their computer to really input what they want instead of having to use a modulation wheel or necessarily pick a, let's say, a violin sample that has vibrato, with this instrument you're able to kind of do your own. So it becomes very, very personal. All the expression uh, is really, really cool. So yeah, so the bottom one has embedded sounds, the top one doesn't, it's a controller. But when you, when you buy it, it ships with something called Equator, which uh, has some great sounds all ready to go, and it's just basically plug and play, which is cool. And I had a question uh, along almost the same lines. Um, how how good of a tool do you see it for a orchestral composer? Because it looks like this incredibly expressive instrument that would work really well with uh, controlling yeah, synth oscillators, totally. which are fairly flexible, but samples can be a little more rigid sometimes. Yeah. So I wonder, like, is there... Maybe you can even name some specific virtual instruments that maybe it works really well with, or maybe sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, it's a great question. And where, Aaron, where are you? So I know your computer probably went to sleep by now, and I want to wake it up so we can show some things. Thanks. So, um, yeah, that's a great question, because the real challenge is... You know, with something that's this flexible, the first question that like my friends ask me is, that, well, I like you know Vienna instruments, and how does it work with that? And I'm like, that's a good question. Um, so, so where Roly is at right now with all that is, yes, it sends out MIDI and it does all the things that it does. It has you know all the pitch and you can do slide. But to work really well with something like a, with another library, somebody would have to program it, whether it's you or somebody you know at Roly or a sound programmer to make it really, really happen. So, and it will happen, it can happen, it should happen. It's one of my missions now that we're at this point and have this keyboard here, because I know guys are gonna say, well, can I play my library, you know, my, my cool libraries with it. So, um, so that's gonna happen. What Roly um, has done is that uh, on Equator right now, what it ships with, there's a lot, we, we just like put a lot of really cool uh, sounds in here to kind of like get people started, so even, You know, like cellos and things where you can um, really express. And we sample things without vibrato too. So if you just hold the note, it's going to be just straight. But if you, you can do your own vibrato, which is nice. And also the touch. So if I play it and then I slide. So you can start to get a lot more articulation than you would have certainly out of any like traditional keyboard with the way that you're expressing it. And that's what it's all about. So it's, um, and it sends out MIDI. So, and not to say it's, it's not like an extra small challenge to plug it into like, let's say a East West library or something like that. But Roly also makes a tool that makes it easy to have multiple instances. Um, Aaron, what's it called? Poly through, something like that? Yes? Yeah, so you can just call up like something uh, like alchemy if you want, just immediately kind of make multiple instances and then when you play a chord it will do its little magic uh, trick, which is the ability to like play and have like each note kind of sliding its own direction like, you know. But on the, the, the uh, software that it ships with, you don't have to think about any of it because it automatically kind of assigns all this MIDI information. It does the right thing with it. Okay. Another question? Right here. How's it going? It's going well. Great. Cool. You mentioned the continuum, which is really cool. That was some of the first sounds I actually heard from Dream Theater, so it's always kind of been right at the front of my mind. Oh, nice. Does the Seaboard and specifically the Rise, just thinking about Octavarium, does it make an immediate impact if you go back and play the beginning of that? Do you feel like you have more control, more freedom to just really explode that four minute intro? Um, yeah, if whenever we come to do that piece again, I probably would do it on the Seaboard because it's, you know, it's no problem to play a note. And 
and, I, and being a keyboardist, I can kind of see exactly what key it's lining up with. It's a, little, it's a little easier for me to play than the continuum, as much as I love the continuum. And it will do the same kind of thing. Basically, the continu continuum was an instrument that allowed you to slide, to press, to play different pitch bends. And in, in many ways, it was a similar idea and does similar things. The main difference is that this is keyboard-based. So, hey, I'm a keyboardist, you know, I spent my whole life playing keyboard, so I don't mind actually seeing where, you know, the notes are and having a little, you know, something raised so I can uh, understand that and get to it more quickly and accurately. Yeah. One more question, anyone? Um, how do you approach writing, composing new music, both like as solo stuff and involved in dream theater? Um, well, let's see, when, when, like an example being that when we left the last tour, uh, John and I discussed this whole uh, idea for the new album, and it really inspired us. So it was, there was no break, really. When I got home, um, I would just have all these ideas. I would just walk over to the piano and just feel inspired to do it. And it's very much like what I was discussing before as far as writing music. Like if I could sit down and I could improvise something, well then... I'm like writing something. The only the only thing is basically when I'm you know writing music, you're making real decisions. You have to make commitments. It's not just like sitting down and you know playing whatever. You have to stop. But you know that that said, I mean writing a piece of music is about you know like playing whatever number of bars. Like I go. Uh, I just wrote something. I we could, you know. So there you go. I I, uh, I send it to John. I say, what do you think of that? That he says, oh, it sucks. Try something else. Uh, and so I go. He goes, oh, I like that. I'm good. So let's use that. So uh, you know, the ideas can come pretty quickly if I'm feeling in the mood. If I can happen, and uh, sometimes the ideas happen, and you don't even know why or where or when. Or other times you just kind of sit at the piano with a mood. You're feeling sad. You're feeling happy. You're feeling loose. Whatever. And, you know, are you trying something? Maybe I'm experimenting with a rhythm thing that might inspire, uh, you know, an idea. But there's so many ways of making music. Maybe I'll have, like, you know, like, some go. And I'll write something on top of the loop. Uh, other times I might just have, like, some interesting chords that I want to do, you know. And then I go from there. There's so many ways to do it. And actually the tools... Can, you know, the tools that we all have available to us, the sequencers, the different kinds of instruments, whether it's like something like a Korg with Karma, or you're using your DAW with the rhythm patterns, and they can kind of help, or they can also keep you in the studio all day trying different sounds and different things, and you can walk out of there with nothing. So it's kind of like, you know, all the, all the toys in the world won't necessarily help you, um, you know, make music. They might help you have a really good time. Um, you'd be happy, even if you didn't come up with anything. But um, yeah, so it's kind of like that. Yeah. Good. Okay, I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that everyone here wants to hear you play some more. Cool. <laughs> oh, thanks. So I do, thank you so much. And I will play some more. I'm, I'm gonna actually just shift gears just for one second um, because I wanna show you this very cool instrument that I've been involved with and I've gotta go over there with my iPad and see if we can get that to work for a second again. Um, let me see how I'm gonna do this.
this is. It's like amazingly thin. What it doesn't have, I'll tell you that first, it doesn't have the actual throw of a real keyboard, but these keys are the real, you know, real size keys. It also is velocity sensitive um, and very durable. I, I actually took this to Poland and checked it in my suitcase and I went to London and I went here. I hadn't really done anything with it until I got here. I checked it out and went, these work. But you never know how they treat your bags. And what you find, this is actually a prototype. So this is supposedly doesn't have the, uh, you know, it's not built as uh, sturdily as, as the ones that it will be in production. Um, so yeah, I totally recommend it. There's octave switches. There's a modulation button. There's uh, pitch bend buttons as well. The sustain. Uh, in addition, what's really interesting about CME is they're always thinking about like the uh, making the software as flexible as possible. You can go and you can change every one of these notes to send out MIDI control. You can do anything with this. Like, you can do fishes with this thing. <laughs> so uh, and really, it's pretty cool. You can change you can change this. The scaling of the keyboard, it does polyphonic aftertouch, so those of you who are hip to that, so you can, you know, make <coughs> notes and kind of press into them almost like a keyboard style. Of course, it doesn't have the organic feel on that level, but uh, if you are a keyboardist and you want to travel, get the uh, Jordan Rudis endorsed uh, CME. <laughs> <laughs>
Keep it going for Jordan Rudis. Beautiful, my friend. Beautiful. Jordan. Jordan will be available across the hall for a little meet and greet afterwards, so please stop by and say hi. I think we got some stuff to sign potentially. So once again, thank you to CME, Korg, and our new friends from Rolly. That fantastic. And a very special thank you to Jordan, because that was incredible. So thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks a lot for coming, everybody.